For your second uh, midterm exam, uh, this, everything will be covered till this Friday will be included. Uh, but it's not going to be anything new. I'm just going to do a few more problems to the end on Friday. But if you understood, I think the last two assignments, uh, number four and number five, linearization will be an important part of the exam. To be able to uh, get the linearized model from a nonlinear model. And the other aspect would be what we are doing in these examples to be able to analyze the dynamics, possibly with a control system, uh, a feedback control, and progressively more complicated and involved block diagrams. How do we do the algebra of uh, block diagrams? And that's what uh, we started doing in the last lecture, and I will do a few more uh, today. Any questions for me before I continue with the previous problem? Last lecture, we did this complete uh, feedback uh, control problem for a simple uh, heated tank. Uh, and uh, we did it in Simulink, and then we did the problem by hand, that is the part that I would want you to focus on for the exam, uh, where we collapse the entire block to an effective transfer function relating the output T prime to the input or the set point change T R prime. So we wanted to get the transfer function output to input ratio as this uh, expression that you see here. You see both of them. Okay, so this is the relationship between the output and the input, and the right hand side contains in the information from every block. And um, in general, there is a rule for these things, and the rule turns out to be: in the numerator, you will have all the types of function in the open loop part, the forward part, and in the Denominator, you'll have one plus the entire thing plus the transfer function that is in the uh, feedback part. For example, if I have, let me just give you an example. If I have GC, GP, and then GM. Just one example. This is a slightly uh, different one from what I've done. So if this is um, y and this is x, okay, here you have plus minus the feedback. Then what is the relationship between y and x? You should be able to do the algebraic process that we did in the last lecture. But in structures like this, by simply looking at it, you should also be able to write down. And that would be simply gc times gp divided by 1 plus G C G P G M. Okay. So between the output and the input, do the open loop part that is cut off the feedback and whatever transfer function that you get, the product of that, G C times G P in this case. There are two two blocks there. Divided by for the feedback part, you will get one plus G C G P the same, multiplied by G M, the one that is in the feedback loop also. So in an exam, you might find that remembering something like this will help you kind of gain a bit of a speed. But if the structure is not this, if it is slightly different, then in that case, I would expect you to be able to go and derive that. So this can be kind of uh, made it into a recipe where I have several levels of structure. And if deep inside, for example, you find this structure, you may be able to replace it by this. And then there may be another structure relating y and x connected to other uh, feedback loops. So you should be able to get that. And by doing more examples, you will see you'll become comfortable with both the algebraic process and to get the input-output relationship. So by doing this, in this particular example, um, we had KC, the controller one, and the heater one, 1 over 14, 1 over WC, 
and the process one which is 1 over 5s plus 1. So this is the entire product of all the transfer functions in the open loop part divided by the same factor that you see, kc, 1 over 14, which is 1 over wc, divided by 5s plus 1. 5 is the time constant for the process uh, in the tank. And this is the transfer function for the feedback loop. In fact, I think we did this in Simulink. Let me just briefly throw up that uh, Simulink block. So here is what we did in the last lecture. The same problem by Simulink. So here we replaced this by just a P. Here I have a PID. But we just had a proportional controller, the heater, the process. Those are the three in the forward. So it's a product of all three. And for the feedback, we have this measurement. Okay. So using that rule, you can write immediately and if you have to know how to do it, you have to go through the uh, algebraic process that we did in the last lecture. So this is where we stop. So this is the effective transfer function. Okay. Now, in an exam, what you need, you need to be able to do is simplify this by hand. Question? No. Yeah, right. So if you look at the PID, I think I must have turned off, or I should turn off. I just have P. I and B are zero constants. If you had an integral, if you had an integral, then it will produce a one over I, I over S here that you put in the top. Okay? That will change it into a third order. Right. Right. Yeah. Very good observation. So it will. The effective transfer function that you get depends on all the components. So. You, in an exam, you should be able to simplify this expression. Once again, my plug for MATLAB, if you do this in MATLAB, it's one minute. And if you read by hand, it could be 10 minutes. It depends on how fast you can do the algebra, You're taking the fact common factors and uh, dividing, things like that. So in the class, I'm not going to do the algebraic manipulation. I do want you to be able to do this for an exam. Okay? That is, take this and simplify it to a numerator or denominator type of expression. You should be able to do that. That's just algebraic manipulation. Okay? I will tell you, this is not complicated. It looks complicated. My promise to you is, if it involves partial fractions, it's not going to be more than a quadratic in the denominator. Okay. So you should be able to do a partial fraction of a quadratic. You should be able to find the root of a quadratic equation. So write it as f plus uh, alpha 1, f plus alpha 2, and then you should be able to do partial fractions. Okay? So that test the idea that you can do. And cubic, anything else is just, you know, because it's just the algebra is complicated. My purpose is to make sure that I've conveyed the idea and you know how to do it. So I will test you only up to a quadratic. And this is not complicated. Well, what will be the highest order here? A quadratic. Right? Because k is kc is a constant. 1 over 14 is a constant. You can actually plug those numbers and simplify it. So you have a number divided by 5s plus 1. and the denominator, you'll have something similar to that. So that will give you a quadratic. No, no, I'll show you in that. I'll show you how I'm not going to do the algebra by hand because that takes a lot of time. There's nothing that you learn. You should know algebraic manipulation. Okay? So I'm going to do this in MATLAB to show you what should the final expression look like. And I would encourage you to go and do it by yourself by hand just to, if you have forgotten algebraic manipulation, to uh, get up uh, back to speed. Okay? So let me bring the MATLAB window. So I'm going to say S equals transfer function S. Okay. And then I'm going to do this. And uh, I don't want to copy the whole I don't want to type the whole thing. Let me see if I can copy it from here. I'm kind of trying to save time on routine mundane things, but I hope I'm not speeding up by that. And I'm telling you in situations where you need to be able to do things on your own. Like, 
what I've done here is type that expression that I have okay, into MATLAB. So G is now a transfer function. Now, the way that the TF function simplified it, it gives you a cubic and a quadratic. Is there something wrong in there? There is nothing wrong in that one. We will show why. Because it, it must have had a factor in both the numerator and denominator that should have canceled. But the transfer function, TF function, did not bother to cancel it. Okay? When you do it by hand, you will get a linear expression in the numerator, a quadratic expression in the denominator. And I will show you also in uh, MATLAB using symbolic processing. This is just a transfer function definition. Okay? So now I have um, the transfer function, okay? the effective transfer function between the input and the output. So if I want to look at the step response to uh, a step magnitude of 10, what do I do? I just type step 10. And that is the step response between the set point change TR and the output change under feedback control with a KC of 20, the proportional feedback. Now, I should have gotten the same thing in the last lecture by running this simulation. Let me just make sure I have 20 there. Yeah. Okay. Let me run this. And compare this one with the one that we did by what I call my hand in a sense. Okay. So in both cases, it goes to a steady state of around six. Okay. And it takes about ten minutes. Here, on the right hand side, I plotted up to thirty minutes. On the left hand side, I plotted up to twelve minutes. But they are exactly the same response. Okay. One was obtained using an effective transfer function between the input and the output. Another must done by using Simulink, okay, using individual blocks. But they are supposed to be exactly the same result. Okay. Any questions on those? So in an exam, if you feel comfortable with using the TL function, you could solve this uh, and then ask, I guess, more detailed questions. But in an exam, what I'm going to be able to do is just get the effective transfer function, do partial fractions, get the time domain solution and then answer questions about that, doing some simple calculations. So what could that be? Again, I'm not going to do it by hand, but you should be able to do it. I keep repeating that. Um, but what I, will, I want to do is um, using sims s. Okay. I want you to also observe the difference between what I did previously and what I'm doing now. What is the difference between this G that you see here and the G that I had earlier on, on the top here? That is a transfer function object. This is a symbolic object. Okay? And it, it again took whatever I input. It didn't simplify it. So if I pass it through simplify in symbolic toolbox and they call it G1, This is what you should get by hand, this expression that you see here. And what is this? This is a quadratic. Okay. The simplify function actually cancels the numerator and denominator and simplifies it. So in the numerator, you have a linear polynomial. In the denominator, you have a quadratic one. Okay. And in an exam, I can then say, once you have obtained this, get the time domain response. What does that mean? You need to do the partial fraction. Up to a quadratic, you should be able to do that. <coughs> what am I doing here? I'm getting the time domain solution for a step change of 10. The step change requires me to put 1 over s. The magnitude of the step is 10, so it requires me to put 10 over s. So I took g1 the effective transfer function, and symbolically multiply it by 10 over s, and then I say plot it to uh, bring it back to the time domain. So that is the time domain solution. 
Now I can ask questions like at what time does it reach 90% of the steady state? Or what is the steady state value? If I ask you what is the steady state value, what will you do from this expression? Take the limit. As t goes to infinity, take the limit of this expression. That will be your steady state. Okay. So whenever you have e to the power minus t, you drop those terms and simplify it, and you should get a number out of it. So you should be able to do things like that. Okay. Any question? It has a cosh and this, yeah. So you can write that as e to the power x plus e to the power minus x over 2. You should know this formula. <laughs> oh, you have a calculator these days, right? The calculators can do a lot of these things for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So well, what what TF function did is simply in the simplification process, it did not cancel out terms that are both in the numerator and denominator. This is my guess. I need to actually study how the TF function handles these things. No, I don't know. Not if it is a transfer function object. Right. If it is a symbolic object, you can always do that. You can factor it. A symbolic toolbox allows a lot of processing. Okay. But you can show that there's a two tangible factors on one You can factor it out. Right. <laughs> but you, you mean you want me to try it on the transfer function? It won't work. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Yeah. So this term that you see here. My assumption is when you factor both the numerator and denominator, there will be an identical factor in the numerator and denominator that cancel out. But the TR function did not bother to do that. Okay. How do we know that? Because we get exactly the same response from what looks like a third order process, it actually is a second order process. And the one that we produce from what is truly a second order process. Okay, in this Any other questions? Hmm. One can actually look into the what the TS function does. It's a huge MATLAB code. <laughs> okay, it goes on for here it's done. This is a built in, it's a function somebody wrote that takes an input and produces the output. The output that it produces is self, which is a transfer function type. So if you go through the logic of this, you will understand why it introduced that factor there. A good question, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't expect you to do that either. But this is one good way of learning good programming practices. Because a lot of these functions in MATLAB that are in the toolboxes are actually M files. The M file that you write, somebody else has written it and produced it as a toolbox. Okay? So you can look at it and you can learn how to program in a more sophisticated way. Um, but some of them are built-in functions. For example, if you say type exp, exponential is a built-in function, so you don't see the code. Okay? That's because most primitive functions are coded in um, the machine language, so that it runs faster. And that's why the toolboxes, a lot of them are available as code that you can study. I've looked at a lot of them and learned a lot about MATLAB programming. Okay, now let's go back to that's the extent of this problem. Let me pose a new problem. And let's do that. Here I don't have the solution on the notes, so I'm going to catch out the solution. And uh, in the class, I'm going to use MATLAB symbolic toolbox as much as possible to avoid algebraic manipulation. But I expect you to be able to do that by hand in an exam. Okay? In an assignment, you are welcome to use MATLAB. But in an exam, you should be able to do what we're doing in the body toolbox by hand. Do you have a question? Okay. Here is the problem. Four first order with dead time systems with parameters in the following table are placed in a non-interacting series. Non-interacting series. 
construct the output response of this system to a step change in the input at time t equal to 2. When you don't specify anything in an assignment, for example, when I don't specify anything like this, you're free to use this simulink, you're free to use MATLAB code, uh, symbolic toolbox, all my hand, whichever you want. Okay? Um, sometimes I will specify <laughs> in an assignment because I want you to get trained in this part. And then the second part is find an equivalent first order system if possible. If possible. Okay? And the four systems are described in a tabular form. The dead time, the time constant, the gain. And there is a graph that is given to you. This is actually taken from lecture 10. This is the re typical response of a first order system. Okay? Now, one of the things that we saw in that is that the first order system uh, has reaches a response of 63.2% of the ultimate value over t one time unit, one time constant. That's an important result to know because later on also we will use that to construct approximate first order models for systems that are really much more complicated, higher order models. And that's something that we're going to do in this problem too. So do you understand what I mean by that? It's an important interpretation. You should be able to interpret a first order dynamic response or a response from a real process, experimental data that is given to you when you're plotting observed variables of time when you get a response that looks like a pure uh, first order kind of response. And to get the time constant, if I give you such a plot and say get the time constant for the process and you don't know what the process is, all you need to do is look at on the y-axis where does it reach 53% of the total step change, unit step change. And what time does it reach? And that time will be your time constant. Because in this figure, that time is t over tau. So when it is equal to 1, t is equal to tau. So a good way of getting an estimate of the time constant is this time it takes to reach 63% of the response. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about there? Okay? All right. How do I do this? <laughs> what do you understand from this problem statement? Unit step change at t equal to 2, right? So, Okay. So, the first thing that you, you, you are on the right track, but if you follow a systematic process, it becomes easier, and the first thing that you need to understand that is for first order with dead time system. How do you model a first order with a dead time system? What is that general form of the transfer function? Very commonly used transfer function. Well, yeah, tau, tau i s plus 1. That captures the first order process. I'm putting a subscript i to indicate that i could be 1, 2, 3, or 4. There are four first order systems. But with a dead time delay. What is the dead time delay? We saw that in a pipe network, right? What is the transfer function for that? e to the power? <coughs> Minus, uh, I'll call it as theta i s. Okay? That is the transfer function for a dead time delay. Okay? So you have a dead time delay plus a first order process. So the net effective transfer function becomes this for each one of them. Okay? And you are given theta i. Theta i is this. Okay. And you are given tau i. And there will be a gain also. Let's put a gain there, ki. Gain is the multiplication factor. Okay. So that, that is the general expression for a first order process with a time delay. And there are three parameters in that. And those parameters are given for you, tau i, ki. And they are told that you are, they are in non-interacting systems in series. Okay? So how would the graph look like? It will look like, for example, if this is x, you're going to have g1, g2, g3, g4, 
4, and that is your output. Okay. So we have already written what G i looks like is K i e to the power minus theta i s divided by tau i s plus 1. So what should be the effective transfer function? All of them multiply. In theory, you multiply them. Later on, you see for parallel systems, there you will have to add them up. Okay? So y divided by x is going to be equal to g1 times g2 times g3 times g4. Okay? So that's going to be equal to, I'm going to write this as pi ki. You know what pi symbol stands for? Sigma is summation, pi is product. Okay? So it's going to be the product of all the ki's. And then I will have e to the power minus summation of theta i s divided by product i going from 1 to n for, for n number of systems like that is going to be tau i s plus 1. Do you understand every symbol there? Okay. Or have I jumped from this to this too much? Is anybody having doubts about why I wrote this like this? Right here. Oh, yeah, you, you, you could put a pi symbol um, in front of both because it's the same, yeah. That, that is the equivalent, yeah. Pi, pi i going from 1 to n. That is the product of i going from 1 to n, ki. Okay? Multiplied by e to the power. Now, each one will give me e to the power minus theta 1 s, e to the power minus theta 2 s, etc. But e to the power an exponent, in the exponent it becomes a summation, e to the power minus theta i s. So what do you see from this result? You see that the net effect of a series of time delays is the total time delay is the summation of individual time delays. Okay? So the second part of the question they are saying approximate this by k effective e to the power minus theta effective s divided by tau effective s plus 1. That is, if possible, get me a first order with time delay transfer function that mimics the net effect of these four transfer functions in series. You cannot. Your observation is right, you cannot. But approximate it. It's not exactly, they're saying it's not exactly the same. That's why I put the symbol. This could be says, can you approximate it? How bad or how good is that approximation? What are the parts of the, the response that you can capture and what are the parts that you cannot capture? Once you do this and plot it, you will see. So the first thing that I want you to notice is that what is KE? The effective gain. Product of all the individual gains. What is the effective delay? Sum of all the delay, effective delays. What is the effective time constant? That is the problem. You cannot get that easily from knowing the individual time constant. So you need to plot the response of this effective transfer function, and then how will you get an estimate of the effective time constant? I already gave you the clue for that, 63% rule. Okay, So you plot the response of the actual system, and if it looks like a sigmoidal graph, then you say, OK, I'm going to look at the 63% time it reaches, and take the time constant. So that that is going to be an effective time constant, and the response will not match completely, but it will. We are making it match in such a way that a first-order system would have reached the same level at the same time. Right? In one time constant, it would have reached 63 percent. So we are matching that part. Am I laid out the problem now? Yeah. Is 
has to look like it. What, what do I mean by that? I mean by that the response, if this is a steady state, the response has to look like this. The response cannot look like this. Then it's not a first order process. Okay? So if the response somehow looks like this or with a delay. It looks like that, then you can say, okay, I'm going to look at 63% response and subtract the delay from that. You have to plot it. You have to, you have to do it. So once again, if I have this problem, I can give you only two two process transfer functions in series. I'm limited to quadratic, right? But I could give you a quadratic two G1 and G2 and say, find me the effective transfer function. That is effectively modeled by a first order process. Okay? I'm going to do that. I'm going to plot the response y, the output response y, for a step change in x. Yes, good question. We need to plot the actual response for the four series uh, transfer functions and then from that graph look at, because this graph that I gave you is for a first order system. So you cannot really, unless the problem that you had in your first exam, I give you this graph and then I ask you questions about it, about the response, then it, it's, it's an exact model. Okay, this is a first order response. And that means at every point it will agree. But if I have a graph that does this, okay, then it doesn't have an overshoot, so I can approximately model it by a first order system, and that means I would have to match at this point. Okay, at the 63%, I match the time constant. So, of course, when I plot that, what graph will I get? At the true first order system, I get back this graph, right? Because that's what the graph is supposed to be. So it's not going to be. So the difference between this graph and this graph shows you how poor. The, the red one is the one suppose I get from the plotting the fourth order system. Okay, with a time delay, the red one looks like this. And then I apply the 63% rule, and I say, okay, at 63%, the red graph reaches at a certain time. Suppose it happens to be 15 minutes. Okay. So my effective time constant is 15 minutes. Then I use that in a first order process and I plot it. Okay, now I've forgotten about the complicated system. I have an estimate of what the time constant is for a first order system. So using the 15 minutes, I plot the first order response. That's going to give me this curve because that is the true curve for a first order response. Okay, and so the difference between these two is an indication of how bad and my first order approximation is to the real system. How do you ever see that you're How do you see it? We're going to do that. Once I plot it, you will know. Okay? This particular graph is normalized, plotted as t over tau. That's why it occurs as 1. But I'm going to plot it in terms of t. And when you do that, you will see when when does it reach that percent 60 percent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. That that is algebraically solving it. Yeah. Instead of graphically plotting it, that is what I guess I would expect you to do in an exam. I don't expect you to graph it, right? So you get it, get back into the time domain, and then ask the question: When the left hand side is 60 percent, what is the time? That is your time constant. Right, to find out what this final value of the steady state is. But if it is a unit step response, then 60% is fine. But if I give you a different step response, then you need to know what the final steady state is and take 63% of that. Good, you guys are getting all, of, all the parts that I wanted you to get at, so I think you are ready for the exam. <laughs> <laughs>
Now it's a matter of doing it. It's in your mind, but it's implementing it. Okay, how do you want to do it? You want me to do it by simulate? You want me to do it in MATLAB using transfer function? Or Laplace, symbolic, symbolic. Three choices you have. <laughs> That's what you're going to do in the exam, but I promise you to only quadratic. This is the fourth order. I can't do it. It'll just waste time in the class. I don't want to do that. You want to do it in simulink? The quickest way is for me to type. Simulink is shuttle. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. That's what I was planning to do, and that's what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to care. I just pretended to give you the option. <laughs> okay. So I've defined the transfer function. So I'm going to, I mean, I've set up the transfer function. I'm going to type G1. I'm going to define four transfer functions. I need to switch between these two. Sorry about that. Bit time, time constant, and gain. Okay. Ah, uh, this time is point four. Uh, I'm not really very good in using the real estate of <laughs> the screen. Uh, can you guys reagate at the notes? Can you tell me the numbers as I type? Okay. So I need G1 equals the gain for the first one. Okay. One. Okay, we don't need that. The time delay. Point. Four. Times S divided by the time constant. One point five times S plus one. Okay. That's G1. Now for the second one, the gain. The, time, uh, the delay. And the time constant. 3.3. Thank you. Oops, 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 oops. I made a mistake. What did I do? I should define that as G2. I should redefine G1. Okay. G3, what is the gain? Three. Delay. And time constant? 5.2. Okay. And G, uh, G4. Thank you. So I have four transfer functions defined. Okay. Now, if I want to define an effective transfer function GE, that's going to be simply product of G1 times G2 times G3 times G4. Let me see whether that level will accept that. There it is. Okay. So you know what is the net gain of the four? It's 0.9975. What is the next uh, delay? 4.2. And in fact, if you see, it will be the sum of all the individual delays. And if you see the gain, it will be the product of all the gains. Okay? So MATLAB has done that product for me and the summation for me. And it has simplified the denominator also. The denominator, I had four first order systems, so it gives me an effective fourth order system. This is where I say I will restrict this to a second order system for you to be able to. Do partial fractions and go back. So, what do we need to do at this stage to plot the response? Step the effective there you have. It. Okay, so you can see a time delay of about 4.2. Nothing happens. Okay, and then it starts take, taking off like a sigmoidal curve. So if you need to estimate what is the time constant, remember now on the x-axis, it is true time. Okay? So to get the time, effective time constant for a first order system, what do you need to do? You need to look at 63%, go there, 
and read from there down. Something around 15 or so. Yeah. Ah, right, right, right. <laughs> actually, actually, that's a good question. How do I do that in the step function? Yeah, that's it. Now, six point. Yeah, yeah. right. Right. I, I need to do this. Very good observation. I really forgot about that part. It specifically says you need to put the step change at two. Okay. Right now, this is a step change at zero. Okay. So what I need to do is. I need to put an additional pure delay. That means I'm just going to multiply this by exponential of minus 2 times n. Otherwise, my estimate of the time constant will be pretty bad. Yeah. No, thank you for fixing that. <laughs> okay. So this doesn't look like anywhere like a first order response. So to construct a first order model for a fourth order model is not good. Why is it not good? Simply because if you look at all the G1, G2, G3, they all have significant time constants. If one was dominant, like if tau 1 was 10 and tau 2 was 0.1, tau 3 was 0.2, then you can say, OK, I can neglect that. Okay? But they are all comparable in magnitude. So a first order system is not going to be a very good approximation, but if you want to get one, an estimate of the first order time constant, then from this graph you will have to read at 63 percent what is the time. Okay, maybe it's around 17 or so, and then subtract the delay, and that will give you the uh, true first order response. You think I can do that? Okay, let's try that. Hold and then step. What do I need to do? I need to plot the effective transfer function, right? So I forgot those numbers. Let me just look at them. Okay. Step. Um, Exp minus six point two. Again, if I make a mistake, correct me. If you don't understand what I'm doing, ask. Okay. Uh, times 0 0.9975 divided by what should I put? Then to put tau s plus one. Okay, but that tau is what I want you to get it from this graph. It's hard to tell. Okay, so we can try. There is a nice feature here. I think if you click on it. It tells you both the y-axis and the x-axis. Not bad, 0.628. <laughs> right? Y is 0.628 and x comes 17.8. Okay? So what is the actual time constant? Okay. You have to subtract the time delay. Right? Fifteen point eight. Yeah. Let's try that. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> that would be first order. It is first order. This, this, this does. What did we do wrong? The time you have to not only account for the two minutes delay that you enforce of the step change, but the process itself has inherent time delay. And that part is captured already by the each to the power minus. Right? So you don't want to capture that in the time constant also. So that was my thinking. So I'm going to check my Minus 6.2, right. So what was it? 17.8, uh, 
<laughs> okay. Seventeen point eight minus six point two. Whatever it is. But you understand what, what I'm trying to do. Okay, I'm trying to to subtract the net delay. When I write when I write a first order with a time delay as e to the power minus theta s divided by tau s plus one. This part takes care of the delay, and then the first order response starts. Okay, so uh, tau s. So the first order time constant should start. You should start measuring it only from the point that it starts taking off, because this enforces the delay. The numerator enforces the delay. Right. So when I'm doing it in MATLAB. So minus 6.2. So nothing is going to happen for this first order transfer function until 6.2. Only then it's going to start taking off. So my clock should start for the first order response at 6.2. And then see how long it takes to reach the 63%. And that is my true time constant for the first order process. Right? So I'm going to have lots of graphs superimposed, I guess. Now it's better. Okay, so the red one is captures both the requirement that the first order process should reach 63% in one time constant. Okay, and the full final value, all of them reach the final value. Okay, and uh, all of them have the initial delay, which is captured explicitly by e to the power expression. But if you want to predict that response at any other time, the true one is the one that will give you the accurate result. The red one gives you slightly better results, but the other one we had a mistake. That's why it's not giving you even a first order response. Now, make sure that you understand this idea of things and whatever is in there. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask so that we can discuss more. Yeah. It is in time, yeah. The tau, the tau by definition is the time it takes for a first order process to reach 63 percent. Yeah. I'm not sure. Let me put, you're talking about this graph? Yeah. If I am plotting y versus t, the real y versus t, then if the graph is like this, 63% whatever is the time, that time will be the time constant. Okay? But if I'm plotting it as t over tau, as in this case, then that should reach at one unit, because when t over tau is equal to one, t is equal to tau. So this graph is a normalized graph for unit step response and for any time constant. Okay, because t is divided by tau. So this graph can be used for any first order process. As long as we know the true time constant, all you have to do is take the x-axis, the x-axis multiplied by tau. That will give you the true time. This is not its true time, it's a scaled time. Scale with respect to Tau as a measuring unit. So one means one time constant, two means two time constant. But if I multiply it by the time constant, I'll get the true time on the x axis. And if I multiply it by the magnitude of the step change, I'll get the true amplitude on the y axis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a small change there, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. There's no offset. What do you mean by offset? Oh yeah, yeah. There is no. This is not a control problem. This is just an open loop response. So the problem is stated as um, there are four processes in series. 
there is no feedback, there is no proportional controller. Offset, when you talk about offset, it is the difference from the steady state, right? If I make a step change, and I expect the process to reach the step change, but it doesn't, it reaches the steady state at a different level, that difference is the offset. And that offset occurs only with proportional controller when there is a control. Here there is no control, so there is really no offset to talk about. It will reach the steady state. If I make a step change of 20 units, it will reach the 20 units. Okay, how long it takes depends on the dynamic response of that. But there is no offset. Uh, the, the gain is the ratio of the output to input in the signal. Okay, so uh, it's a process gain because it appears in front of the process sensor function K1, K2, K3, K4. So each process would amplify the unit step change. You are putting an input step change of 1, but if the gain is 2, for example, the steady state output will be at 2. If any one of the K values is 2, the steady state output will be at 2. In this case, you are putting a unit step change and the net gain, the product of all the four K values is 0.99. Happen to be very close. We are really going slow now because I wanted to do at least two problems, but I think it's important if you guys feel comfortable with the space, we'll go at the space, okay? And one, one or two more problems on Friday. Yes, yes. The time constant tau 1 and tau 2 will be such that the discriminant in the quadratic is negative. That gives you an i, square root of 1, minus 1. That gives you the sine and cosine that gives you the oscillation. Okay? So by simply playing with these four time constants, I can produce an underdamped system. Yeah. So the choice that they have here doesn't produce that. That will also have an effect, right? Yeah. Those are the variations I could put in an exam. Same problem, I just changed tau 1 and tau 2 and say try to see whether you can fit by a first order system. And if you see the response has, having sinusoidal oscillation, decaying oscillation, your answer should be no, it can't be done. Right? And you should understand why for the test happened. Okay, I guess uh, I'm running out of time now. So.